Good evening, everyone. I'm John Goodlad. I'm president of the Australian Institute for International Affairs here in Western Australia. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to our very first webinar. And of course, we're having a webinar because we live in very strange and challenging times with the COVID-19 virus um, changing our way of life. So I think you'll find tonight, I'm actually at the office, a guest speaker's in his home study. Uh, Ash, our, our, who's managing events, you won't see, is, uh, is at his place. But uh, a lot of people have been involved in putting this together and a lot of people have been involved in practising to make sure it works well. So a particularly warm welcome to everyone. And it's actually sold out. We've got a few hundred people who registered for, for tonight. And um, I think that reflects the, um, the subject matter we're about to discuss. Uh, as people are aware, I hope you're all aware, that the role of the Institute is to promote a deeper understanding of international issues. And um, the topic tonight, the politics of pandemics, COVID-19 and the international order is a very timely uh, topic for us to discuss. And one of the things we typically do is acknowledge uh, the Noongar Wadjuk people, the traditional custodians of the land. And I'd like to pay uh, respect on behalf of all of us to their elders uh, past, present and emerging. And one of our traditions too is actually to talk about the fact that here in Western Australia, and a lot of people are here in Western Australia, but a lot of people aren't. They're, they're visiting from elsewhere and internationally as well. But we had six seasons here, not four. And this season is known as Jera um, in the Noongar dialect. Uh, and it's um, famous for the cool nights and dewy mornings and uh, light breezes and getting ready for the deep winter that's coming. So, um, which normally comes about Anzac Day. So we've got a little bit of decent weather going forward. Now the format for tonight is, I'll introduce our guest speaker. Uh, there's time for Q&A at the end of it. Um, now, if you have a look at your screens and look down the bottom, you'll see a Q&A button. And um, if you would care to submit any questions on that, I'll collate them and uh, we can discuss them at the, end of the, at the end of the presentation. So there's a Q&A button there. Please use it. Please ask any questions you like and um, I'll collate them and, and pass them on to our guest speaker. And the plan is to finish at about quarter to eight Western, uh, Western Australian time. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Mark Beeson. Uh, our very own Mark Gleeson, who's a Professor of International Relations at the University of Western Australia. He's also Research Chair of the Australian Institute of International Affairs nationally. Uh, and he's taught at Murdoch, Griffith, Queensland, York and Birmingham universities. Um, he writes heaps of books. He's a prodigious writer. Books, articles, um, all sorts of things. He's originally from Barnsley in Yorkshire. Which, um, which is interesting. He's over here in, um, in Western Australia, but not only does he write books, but he posts on Facebook too. And he's just done a terrific thing on some of the famous songs of the 60s and a little bit of synchronicity. I thought he might like The Shadows. And sure enough, the first record he ever bought was Apache by The Shadows. So, but I thought he liked The Kinks as well. And he chose The Kinks in his top 10 from, from the 60s as well. But with that, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Mark Beeson to discuss the politics of pandemics, COVID-19 and the international order. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much for the introduction, John, and uh, uh, hello to everybody, and thanks for tuning in from all over the place in Western Australia and elsewhere. And uh, perhaps after that introduction, I should just stick to an analysis of pop music and everybody would be much happier, I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, this is, a, this is, if it's nothing else, this is an important uh, issue. And the reason that we're all sitting in our front rooms and uh, at the moment, uh, clearly there's nothing else to do. That's why a lot of you have tuned in, I suspect. But, uh, but for whatever reason, I think we're all kind of interested, concerned uh, about how it affects our own lives individually, but also about what the implications might be for the wider international system of which we in Australia are a small but not entirely insignificant part. So, uh, so what I thought I'd do tonight is to try and give you a few ideas about what some of the big issues are in this uh, unfolding saga. Uh, and obviously it's going to be very subjective and uh, I should say at the outset that I'm no expert on the health 
uh, aspects of this particular debate. And but well, let me just make one observation to start off and be a little bit provocative. But it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, everybody is wheeling out health experts to talk about things, and and in some way shifting the blame to these people. If you've got to get locked down, it's because the health experts tell us to. It's interesting and revealing, I think, that the same logic doesn't apply to climate change, for example, where lots of experts have been saying, well, we've got some serious problems here, but uh, it's striking and uh, illuminating that Scott Morrison et al. don't wheel out people who are recognised experts in that field. So I just thought I'd throw that in because it's not irrelevant to what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I've got a little PowerPoint here. You'll either be thrilled or disappointed to hear. And I think if the technology works, uh, you should be seeing that now, should you? Yes. Okay, good. Can you give me a thumbs up, John, if you're listening and that you can see? Okay, that's good. Okay, so that's a little PowerPoint. I'm going to talk to this. Uh, the politics of pandemics uh, and I've got a few slides and uh, I can come back to them in Q&A if there's anything that particularly uh, takes your fancy and you want to talk about a bit more. And I've got a few startling facts and figures uh, on my right hand side and a piece of paper here which I shall refer to occasionally because uh, some of the detail is worth thinking about and uh, quite astounding in some ways. So uh, let, let's see how we go and let's see if I can work the technology. Uh, turn over the page. Is so that going to happen? Yes. Okay, so let me start off by saying something about uh, the origins of uh, the current pandemic, COVID-19, as we've come to call it. Uh, and I've got no idea uh, exactly where it came from or how it came about or what the uh, biological origins of this may have been. Uh, but I am interested in the kind of politics around it and the discourse that's emerged around it as well. And the very fact that there is uh, a big debate about where it came from, who's responsible uh, and what the uh, impact of that might be is revealing and significant in itself. And there's a very uh, good, if that's the word to describe it, a well-made, sophisticated documentary that's been financed by Falun Gong. Uh, the banned religious organization from China that claims that uh, the virus escaped from a Chinese lab and that uh, it's all uh, part of a germ warfare uh, program that went wrong. Now, that sounds highly unlikely. It sounds uh, more likely that it's a case of Occam's razor and uh, it probably did originate from a so-called wet market in Wuhan and that's the uncontroversial origin of this particular virus and it's happened before uh, in various places at various times. So that seems the most uh, likely explanation. But there's a big point to make about this as well, I think, and that's that we uh, as a species, as human beings, are clearly having a growing impact on the natural environment, the biosphere upon which we ultimately depend. And as the human population expands, it's moving into areas and having an impact on parts of the world uh, and the natural world, which it's never done before. And that's not only increasing our interaction with animals in a way that hasn't happened before, but it's also increasing uh, the interaction between different species of animals, particularly when they take them to places like wet markets in Wuhan. So the chance uh, of new diseases emerging, here's my first amazing stat for the evening. Between 1960 and 2004, 335 new diseases were identified, uh, of which 60% uh, were estimated to, to have come from non-human origin. So that's a pretty amazing statistic. And it kind of reminds us that uh, our, our collective impact on the natural environment has potentially very, very serious consequences, not just for the natural environment and the poor old animals that uh, inhabit it, but for us too. So there's, there's a bit of uh, blowback from the way that we're treating the natural environment that I think we need to uh, take seriously and need to think about uh, when we're thinking about what sustainable policies might look like in the future. And that's not necessarily just sustainable environmental policies, although I personally think that's a big part of it, but just how we can survive as a species without putting ourselves at enormous risk every few years uh, as we are uh, instrumental in generating new forms of uh, pathogens and uh, viruses that directly threaten uh, our uh, 
uh, survival, perhaps. Uh, we've also, of course, in the way that we uh, mass produce food, uh, and this is not me ranting about everybody needs to be a vegetarian, although maybe that might be what it'll come down to eventually, because what we're getting at the moment, I think, is a snapshot of what the world might look like if it's actually constituted on a more sustainable basis. And it might mean a lot less flying around, a lot less eating animals, a lot less mass production of animals in the way that we're doing at the moment in which we use antibiotics uh, to uh, stop the animals from getting uh, particular diseases, but that also lowers our collective immunity to new diseases as well. The other point that's worth uh, mentioning at the outset is that this problem is not uh, a new one. The scale and the people it's affecting, that's new and different, no doubt about it. And that's why we're all concerned in a place like Australia, because we've been uh, blissfully uh, ignorant and immune to some of these uh, problems in the past. But now we're discovering that they're first world problems too. But the, the, the big point to, to emphasize, I think, is we've had plenty of warning uh, about these kinds of things. We've had bird flu, SARS, and various other horrors like Ebola. Uh, but they haven't really affected uh, people like us in countries like us or the US or Western Europe. And so we've kind of ignored them and we haven't taken the warning signs terribly seriously, I don't think. And that's been a problem. Uh, and I think a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of blame to go around uh, when we're thinking about why we're so badly prepared for this. So that's, that's something to think about. Uh, let me just see if I can get onto slide two which I can. So in the context of uh, the world that we live in, we've become kind of used to, uh, excuse me, thinking about the world as being increasingly global. And we could spend a couple of hours just talking about what we all think globalization actually means, but we won't get bogged, on, bogged down on that tonight. But I, but I think the, the interesting thing is that we've, lots of people in the West, particularly uh, affluent people like ourselves uh, and uh, people with the ability to take advantage of many of the good things about globalization have had a, a view often that globalization, whatever you take it to mean, and it's usually about the uh, growing interdependence economically of different countries around the world. Most people have thought that's a pretty good thing, particularly in the West. Now, it hasn't always been uh, for everywhere in the world. And it's interesting, I don't know if you've all been following what's happening in Singapore at the moment. Uh, the rich, uh, well-to-do middle-class population of Singapore hasn't been badly affected by the coronavirus outbreak, but the poor uh, people who keep the economy going and don't get paid much and live in pretty appalling conditions, they have been badly affected. And that kind of illustrates in a kind of snapshot just how uh, uneven the impact of some of these things actually is. Although we know uh, as well that one of the things that globalization is doing is helping to ensure that even rich people uh, in the developed world, um, powerful people in the developed world aren't immune from these kinds of things either. And Boris Johnson and various other people are good examples of this. Now, one of the other things that's become uh, a big talking point at the moment, and uh, before I even talk about this, it's worth, I wrote a little article the other day uh, called, We're All Socialists Now. And the basic idea of that was that uh, in a moment of crisis, even uh, free market champions uh, and ideological sympathizers with free market economics and all the rest of it, like Scott Morrison uh, and Josh Frydenberg, are prepared to junk all of the conventional wisdom overnight because they realize that the crisis they're facing demands that uh, states act in particular ways, in ways that only states can do in some ways, locking cities down, compelling people to behave in certain ways. Only states can really do that. So it's interesting that uh, the problem dictates the solution to some extent, and that's worth keeping in mind as a general point, I think. And it's interesting that the debate about the merits of globalization has rapidly changed in some ways, not just because it's obvious that some people are in a much less favorable position to respond to this kind of challenge than others. And, you know, when you think about Africa, the Middle East, other places. But because even in the rich world, uh, it's becoming painfully apparent that countries like the United States, for example, are highly dependent on other countries, particularly China, uh, unfortunately, to supply uh, various sorts of uh, personal protective equipment, as we've 
learned to call it over the last week or two. Before I say anything about that, let me just run this amazing statistic past you. Uh, at the beginning of uh, January, when everybody thought this is just a problem in China, it's going to go away, Mr. Trump was saying it's going to be no worse than the flu, half a dozen people will be affected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The United States, the free market model of the world, uh, exported uh, their exports of face masks and other PPE uh, equipment uh, increased by a thousand percent in a couple of weeks as they ramped up production to satisfy the demands of the Chinese market. Now that policy doesn't look quite as good as it did uh, then perhaps, it may not look too good then to some people, but uh, at the moment America is only capable of uh, supplying about 3.5 billion face masks, which is an estimated 1% of what they need to deal with this uh, pandemic effectively in America at the moment. And this shortage of preparation uh, and the uh, inability to provide basic equipment in the United States uh, is a problem domestically at the best of times, but it's been heightened by uh, the dependence on suppliers in other countries. And it's interesting, in Australia now, the Australian government is now talking about the need to uh, revitalise the manufacturing sector, which they allowed to wither on the vine, of course, when they thought it was ideologically uh, useful to do so. Uh, now they've rediscovered the merits of having uh, a domestic manufacturing sector that can actually do things uh, and make things that are necessary in times of these kinds of crises. So, so there's been an interesting, uh, 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 if, if somewhat modest, debate about the nature of uh, effective security policies in the contemporary uh, era and what our attitude should be to thinking about security questions as a consequence of that. I mean, uh, without wanting to get bogged down in international relations theory, there is an interesting kind of distinction between whether we're talking about security as it affects us as individuals or whether we're thinking about the security of the state and threats from other states. And clearly, we've spent an awful lot of money recently and are about to spend even more on protecting ourselves from uh, some unknown threat, i.e. China, uh, in the region by buying lots of planes and submarines when maybe we should have been spending a bit more money on preparing ourselves for these kinds of problems which are not going to go away in the future I don't think so maybe we need to have a really serious and thoughtful debate about what the nature of security actually is uh, and the best ways of trying to prepare ourselves for it so this bottom uh, point on this slide is uh, should we have been thinking about other threats other than the kind of conventional ones that dominate the policy debates in places like uh, Canberra, Washington, and Beijing for that matter as well. So do we need to have a serious rethink about some of these things if we're going to uh, have more confidence in our ability to deal with these kinds of recurring threats and uh, problems? So the other thing that the crisis has done, and this is comparative politics 101, is to throw a fairly unflattering uh, light on many of the countries around the world for different kinds of reasons. And it's putting everybody's political systems and particularly their health systems uh, to an enormous kind of stress test and revealing the relative strengths and weaknesses of uh, different uh, systems as a consequence. And also the importance of leadership, of course, as well. Now, China initially, I think everybody agrees, uh, didn't cover themselves in glory. The instinctive reaction of the Chinese Communist Party was to suppress and cover up bad news. Anything that threatens the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party is considered to be a bad thing and is ruthlessly suppressed. And it's interesting that the whistleblowers uh, in Wuhan were uh, penalized and uh, forcibly shut up by the authorities initially, rather than being taken seriously uh, and their concerns being uh, addressed. So China didn't get off to a bad start and was rightly uh, criticized by all and sundry uh, for attempting to uh, shut down uh, the information about the debate. However, once they realized that uh, this wasn't something they were going to be able to uh, cover up, 
uh, to their credit, they acted remarkably quickly. Uh, and shutting down a major city like Wuhan is uh, no small job. Uh, and clearly, it helps if you're an authoritarian regime uh, and uh, citizens are used to being to doing what they're uh, being told to do. And uh, there's not a great deal of uh, pushback from uh, civil society, as it were. So in some ways, uh, China was able to kind of play to its strengths, whatever you think of those, uh, and authoritarian uh, enforcement of the lockdown worked pretty successfully, I think it, it has to be said. So the contrast with uh, other countries in Western Europe and the United States is striking and instructive. And it's worth remembering that China has had a bit of experience with dealing with SARS uh, a few years ago, so it recognized the potential significance of the problem uh, in a way that the United States and Western Europe, I don't think did. Uh, and you know, Boris Johnson has been famously re revealed to have not attended the first five meetings of the security group that was meant to deal with this kind of problem because he thought it wasn't likely to be a problem. It was only something that really affected all those people over in the Far East. Uh, and I think that kind of uh, smug complacency uh, has been revealed as being extremely uh, badly advised and uh, dangerous. So the the relative and different responses that countries have come up with to deal with this pandemic have been thrown in very, very sharp relief. And the United States uh, has become the unfortunate benchmark, I think, in how not to deal with this crisis. They've got the highest rates of infection now, the highest death toll, uh, they've got the least preparedness uh, to actually respond to and deal with this, partly because of the uh, political system in the United States and the kind of federal system, partly because of the entrenched, polarized views amongst political operatives uh, in the United States, which have been poisonous and uh, highly polarized for years now. And in a moment of crisis, I don't think they are rallying around the flag in quite the way we might have expected them to under the circumstances. And I think that's partly because of this, the entrenched divisions, but it's also partly because of the astonishing lack of coherence and credible leadership on the part of Donald Trump. And if I can be permitted a short diatribe, I mean, if the, if the Americans had searched high and low for a more incompetent, uh, less able, less intellectually competent leader than Donald Trump. They'd have struggled to come up with, with one, in my view. And yet it's, a, it's an indictment of the American political system uh, that somebody like him can ascend to the most powerful position on the planet, never mind uh, in the United States. Because whatever the United, the United States would, does, for better or worse, is going to affect the rest of us. And if they're not capable of sorting out their own problems, they may seem to blame shift to other people. Uh, and if they're not capable of exercising leadership, other people will look to step up possibly. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But, but I think one thing that the crisis has revealed is the, uh, the structural weaknesses in the American health system that everybody kind of knew about, but nobody really cared about very much because it only affected poor people who often didn't vote. Uh, and if they did vote, they voted for Donald Trump anyway. And it wasn't really an issue that cut through uh, to a lot of people in the United States because it didn't really affect them. And I think now uh, the realization that it's pretty hard to escape, poor people are still being overwhelmingly badly affected uh, more than wealthy people who are able to insulate themselves and go to their second homes in the country and all the rest of it. But but even so, I think that the penny or the dime or whatever it is they use in America has finally dropped and people have recognized that these kinds of health issues, are uh, they get out of hand very, very easily. And this picture I've included on this slide of uh, mass burials in the New York Park, it's not a good look for any country, uh, particularly the so-called leader of the free world and the the kind of light on the hill and the model for uh, democracy, good politics and international leadership. I mean, it's just not happening uh, in the United States at either a domestic uh, or an international 
level. And in some ways, and this is the point about Trump as being a symptom as well as a cause. I mean, I think many of these problems existed before Trump arrived. And that's part of the reason that Trump was able to uh, win this surprise election and maybe he'll still win the next one. Who knows if they have it? Uh, that's probably me being paranoid, but, uh, but these are strange times. And the idea that it's too difficult to have an election in the middle of a pandemic might be an idea we might have to think about and wrestle with in the not too distant future. But anyway, we will cross that bridge when we come to it. But I think there's no doubt uh, that Trump's uh, arrival on the political scene tells you something about the, the state of international politics more generally. Uh, and it's not a uniquely American problem either. There are plenty of populist right-wing demagogues in Eastern Europe and other places around the world. Uh, and clearly, for better or worse, these kinds of people are able to connect with some of the people who haven't done well out of the kind of globalization process I was talking about uh, a moment ago. So there are plenty of people who are unhappy even before the coronavirus came along. Uh, and anybody who says they've got a, uh, a solution to this kind of problem, uh, and it only requires us to lock up the borders or to penalize foreigners or to break off trade relationship with China. Some people think that sounds pretty good. That sounds like a reasonable kind of idea. And the danger is that those people uh, can either get themselves elected or in the, in the middle of, a, of an unprecedented uh, health crisis can actually use the crisis to cement their authoritarian uh, position uh, and make it difficult to get rid of them. And I think that's what Orban in Hungary has been doing, for example. And so I don't know when their next election is due, but it could be quite a long time uh, the way things are going. So this is a, this is a widespread problem uh, that was developing anyway, but has been uh, exacerbated by the crisis, I think. So let me say something about uh, international leadership in this kind of context. And I think the big point to make here is that uh, questions about international leadership were already on the agenda even before this uh, crisis uh, took hold. And there was already a growing uh, competition between uh, the People's Republic of China and the United States about uh, who had the best uh, economic system, who had the best political system even. Uh, and it's interesting that people talk favorably about the so-called China model as a way, particularly for developing countries, to organize not just their economies, but maybe their political uh, institutions uh, as well. And given that it's not that long ago when we had the so-called global financial crisis that had its origins in the United States, and which did a great deal to undermine America's famous soft power, uh, then America's reputation was already damaged to some extent by the global financial crisis. And interestingly, China came to the rescue in that crisis uh, and essentially uh, did Keynesianism on stilts and uh, rescued the global economy, uh, certainly the East Asian economy and the Australian economy, in a way that the United States was again demonstrated not to be able to do, and to some extent not to be able to understand quite what was going on uh, as well, I think. So the danger in this uh, crisis is I think it would be fanciful to expect Mr. Trump to come up with a sophisticated and penetrating analysis of what's going on and what the crisis means, either in health terms or international politics terms. But I think the, uh, the temptation to blame others for his own failings is something he's demonstrated uh, on numerous occasions uh, and the chance to blame China for the, the Wuhan virus or the China virus. Uh, clearly, that's where it came from originally. But suggesting that uh, it's uh, exclusively China's problem uh, and that we wouldn't have been exposed to these kinds of problems at some stage anyway, I think is uh, fallacious and difficult to sustain. So the, the problem is uh, that relations between the great powers were already bad. And I think if we're to do anything about this particular crisis and many other things that we face collectively, uh, climate change being the obvious case in point, but if we're to do anything about any of the big challenges that face us as a species these days, then I think it's important that we uh, think about 
how we can promote rather than undermine uh, cooperative relations between countries everywhere. And this might sound a bit fanciful, and it probably is, to be fair. But uh, that's kind of what we need to do, and that's likely to bring about better kinds of international outcomes than the opposite, which is blame shifting uh, and systematically working to break down the international trade system. And that's important, not just because of this uh, growing uh, interest in economic self-reliance and things like industry policy. Uh, and there, there may be good arguments in actually doing some of those things, but breaking down the international trade system is not a good idea, I don't think. And we know what the kinds of consequences of that can be because uh, the Great Depression demonstrated what bad policy and shutting down the trade system can do. And the other point to emphasize is that uh, liberal commentators have long argued uh, that greater economic interdependence between countries makes the prospect of war much less likely. And there are plenty of people at the moment uh, even before this coronavirus took hold, people like Graham Allison in the States, who's written uh, a lot about the so-called Thucydides trap, which means that there's a certain inevitability about rising powers wanting to challenge declining powers, which I think that's what America is, with or without Trump, uh, and that he thinks war is likely as a consequence. Uh, so given that kind of backdrop about people being seriously concerned with the deteriorating security environment even before the crisis took hold, then the, uh, the dangers of uh, inflamed rhetoric about uh, who's responsible, cutting off relations, blaming other people, that's not going to help at all, it seems to me. And it's going to uh, encourage the growth of nationalism, which is already a pop problem. It's going to encourage populists like Trump and others, and it's going to en encourage intolerance uh, of other countries. And that would be most unfortunate, particularly for those countries who've done uh, nothing to bring this problem about uh, and who are least able to respond to this kind of problem uh, effectively, it seems to me. There's a couple of quotes here, and I'll just let you read them while I have a swig of my glass of water. And that's what it is, not neat gin, as John might lead you to believe. But uh, So this is a couple of quotes that I found in recent editions of Foreign Affairs, and that's an interesting magazine. It's interesting because it's the kind of premier outlet for fairly mainstream liberal views in the United States about American foreign policy. But And this guy, Richard Hass, is the uh, president of the Council on Foreign Relations and a former editor of the... Uh, he may still be the editor, actually, of Foreign Affairs, but he is making the point that America's attractiveness, its values, uh, the American model, the American way of life, American leadership uh, has been profoundly undermined by a series of domestic failures, of which the uh, health crisis is but one example, and the failure of American leadership in the international system. There's another guy mentioned Pei, I think he pronounced his name, who's a former uh, Chinese mainlander, who's now a prominent American academic and citizen, who thinks that uh, Americans should, as they say in America, double down on their uh, hardline uh, quasi-containment strategy towards the United States, because he thinks that the Chinese system uh, is in real trouble uh, and that an authoritarian regime whose legitimacy and competence is in question is even more vulnerable to these kinds of shocks, uh, these kinds of losses in confidence uh, about the uh, ruling elites, towards the ruling elites than, than they are in the United States. So that's kind of interesting uh, that there are people thinking that both sides have got real problems and real difficulties in managing this particular crisis uh, and so there's a lot at stake for both of these countries. So I thought you might find them if interested. But there are a lot of interesting debates in foreign affairs at the moment. The other thing, I don't know how I'm going for time. I'll, uh, I'll try and uh, wrap this up. I've only got a couple more slides. But let me just say something briefly about multilateralism. And uh, I should put my cards on the table and say that I'm a big fan of the 
idea of multilateralism in principle. I'm a big fan of the United Nations. I'm a big fan of the Euro European Union. I don't think there is a bigger fan of the European Union. Uh, and uh, I think in principle, uh, they are a good idea. That's multilateral institutions. The World Health Organization hasn't covered itself in glory uh, in this particular crisis. I think there's no doubt about that. And there are doubts about uh, the role of Mr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, if that's how you pronounce his name, and his relationship to China and his deference uh, to China. I don't know if you can see this picture prop properly on your uh, screens at the moment, but that's him uh, bending the knee to President Xi Jinping. And a lot of people have said that the WHO has been far too uh, uh, servile in its approach to China, has been unwilling to criticize China, and has been slow to respond to uh, China's mishandling of the initial uh, crisis. And I think there's uh, a good deal of merit in those kinds of uh, criticisms. However, it's the best we've got. It's the only international we've, organization we've got that's in a position to try to coordinate responses to these kinds of, uh, this kind of problem and to highlight what good practice and policy might actually look like and to encourage people to do it. The United States, of course, led by Mr. Trump, has just decided to withdraw funding from the WHO uh, to punish it for its role in supporting China, as Trump would see it. And uh, they account for 22% of the WHO's funding. And this is not going to be uh, an easy uh, gap to fill. Uh, for the WHO and the people who are going to suffer mainly are going to be those people in parts of the developing world where there is no other real option other than some sort of external intervention and assistance to try to address uh, what are already appalling health outcomes and circumstances with or without the coronavirus uh, epidemic. And if it takes hold in some of these uh, monstrous in the sense of large uh, refugee camps around the world, uh, watch out because it's going to be horrendous. So, so anyway, the, the American response has been to undermine the existing multilateral architecture because Trump's not terribly impressed with it. Uh, so that's a problem anyway. It's particularly a problem in the European Union's case because in my view, the European Union is the best example we've ever had of sustained international cooperation across national borders. Yes, it's got all kinds of problems. Yes, it's got a bloated bureaucracy and it's ineffective and uh, at times and can do its job. But if it disappears, the symbolism, symbolism alone of it disappearing will be profound because people, will, realists in particular, will just say, there you go, we told you, international cooperation is impossible. It's every person for themselves. Nationalism is the only way to go and cooperation will never happen. And they may well be right, but if they are right, the implications for the international system, for North-South relations, for our ability to be able to encourage people to become Democrats, to cooperate with Russian national borders, will be dealt an almighty blow from which they may never uh, recover. So for some of my colleagues who like to think of themselves as cosmopolitans and interested in universal values and uh, global citizenship and all of these highly worthy and desirable things, uh, it's not a happy moment at the moment and things are likely to get worse. And, and the people invoke this idea of the international community endlessly. I've never been entirely sure what it means, but uh, I think it's going to be even more difficult to identify what the international community is uh, as a consequence of this particular problem and the absence of American leadership in particular. So, oh, yes, sorry, this, has got, oh, this is my last but one slide. I'll just whiz through this because we can talk about this in Q&A. But the, the point about this slide is just to highlight that we've kind of been here before, particularly in an economic sense, uh, and we know what uh, a major economic downturn can do, not just in terms of uh, doubling, trebling, quadrupling unemployment rates in different countries that thought they were immune to such thing, uh, but in transforming politics as well. I think that's one of the big dangers, that if unemployment rates spike in the US even more than they have done already, I shudder to think we might get even more people turning out 
armed to the teeth, protesting about their rights to go back to work and do all kinds of other things than we've seen already. So the, the possibility and the, the potential for things to go badly wrong uh, in this kind of unprecedented, in our lifetime at least, uh, problem are real and uh, not to be uh, overlooked, I think. The, the dangers of making the same kinds of policy mistakes that people made in the 1930s are also worth taking seriously as well. And Trump was already well on the way to making those kind of mistakes even before the coronavirus took hold uh, in this kind of trade war with China, which was quote unquote, easy to win, we'll all remember. Turned out it wasn't quite as easy as he thought. And he's trying to get imports of PPE from China because they can't produce enough uh, in the United States. So the stakes uh, and the historical lessons are sobering and uh, in, important, it seems to me. So I think this is definitely going to be my last slide. Indeed it is. So uh, this is uh, the kind of proverbial wake up call uh, in a number of different areas, I think, most obviously in about the lack of preparedness from people who really ought to have known better because people like Bill Gates have been banging on about this for 10 years and saying it's only a question of time and lots of more informed people than Bill Gates have been talking about this for a long time. So we really should have been better prepared uh, than we are. And just there's another amazing statistic for you. Uh, the US, let me just see if I can find this somewhere. Uh, the US currently spends, what is it? Uh, I don't know if I'll find it. 3.5, oh, here we go, here we go. Uh, the US spends 180 billion on anti-terrorism operations and 2 billion on preparing for pandemics. So uh, in terms of our preparedness, our sense of priorities about what we ought to be thinking about, what represents a real threat to humanity and to us as individuals, I think that's a pretty glaring indication of where priorities still lie. And hopefully uh, this might do something to jog a bit of rethinking. It's also worth thinking that uh, one of the, the welcome uh, effects of this particular crisis is that CO2 emissions have plummeted. Uh, you can see China from a satellite or parts of it for the first time in decades. Uh, other part, you know, India's, uh, Delhi's pollution level uh, is much better than it was. And you can see people have seen uh, the Himalayas from, I think it's, is it from Delhi or somewhere? I can't remember if you can see them from there, but from, uh, from uh, for the first time in years and years. So that's a welcome and uh, revealing uh, uh, issue as well. So I'm getting the wind up from our host. So, so I might leave it there, but, uh, but I think we ought to think uh, long and hard about the kind of historical uh, lessons and issues that this crisis should be uh, forcing us to think about and should be concentrating the minds uh, of policymakers everywhere. And I think it's good, uh, and this is a little uh, uh, cautious note of praise for Morrison and uh, Frydenberg that they ditched uh, economic policies that were clearly unsuitable for the kind of crisis that they were facing. And maybe we should think about that in other areas as well health and the environment being the obvious two, perhaps. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, John. Well, thank you very much, Mark. A, a very good tour of the horizon and um, some very interesting um, conclusions as well. Um, we've had a lot of questions. I might draw a halt to the questions if I may, because there are heaps. <laughs> um, I might, so I've been carefully curating them. Um, Apart from the obvious one, which was right at the outset, did the professor follow Hank Marvin to Australia? Those of you who know Hank, Hank Marvin is the lead guitarist for The Shadows, but I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, but the first set of questions relates to um, the US action in um, potentially withdrawing fund, funding for the World Health Organization. And uh, how does this affect Australia? And how does this accelerate geopolitical shifts, that's from Esther Power. And um, Aston Kwok has added to that one saying, um, how should we consider um, the Scott Morrison proposal and who should have powers, if you like, of forcible entry, uh, similar to the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. So Sorry, what's the Morrison proposal? 
that was that um, you know who can go in, the World Health Organization can go in and investigate and has powers to do so. Oh, okay. And Morrison saying what? I missed this. Morrison suggesting that that's something that the World Health Organization can do and can help us in terms of this virus, um, this pandemic, and potential future ones. So a couple of questions relating to the World Health Organization. And we do have a couple of questions about Donald Trump, so we can leave Trump out of okay. most of these. Okay. Well, as I say, as far as the World Health Organization is concerned, uh, it, it's not brilliant. No, no complex multilateral organization is ever going to be problem free or ever, ever going to be able to do all of the things we would like it to do. Uh, I mean, it's full of fallible human beings who have their own interests and perhaps different agendas and uh, and the guy who's leading it doesn't uh, inspire complete confidence, it has to be said. Uh, but having said all of that, it's the best we've got at the moment. Uh, I think it would be foolish to undermine one of the few institutions that's potentially uh, well-placed to do something about this and to respond to this and to coordinate uh, actions and to cajole people into behaving in sensible and appropriate ways under the circumstances. And I think that's one of the, re well, I won't talk about Trump, but, uh, but anyway, I think, so I think the, the argument for continuing to fund the WHO, it seems to me, is, is pretty solid, just because it looks mean-spirited and uh, very parochial, if you don't, apart from anything else. I, I have to say, I'm not familiar, I'm somewhat surprised by Morrison's uh, attitude if he's saying the WHO oh this is about the investigating where the origins of the virus was is that what okay I'm with you now yeah, yeah, yeah okay so I think that is kind of interesting uh that that uh, Maurice Payne would have made that kind of statement about having an independent uh, investigation into where the virus originated uh I don't think it was necessary to take for Australia to take quite such a high profile uh, striking of attitudes uh, in relation to our principal trading partner. Perhaps that displays a craven lack of backbone on my part, but it it seemed to be the the Chinese will undoubtedly see this as Australia acting acting as a kind of stalking horse for the United States, doing their di dirty work, us ingratiating ourselves with the Americans uh, and various other things. And there's a bit in that, of course, historically. So you can understand why they might think that. But uh, but I don't really think that at the moment, agonizing about where it came from is the most important thing. Doing something about it and stopping it would seem to be uh, more important, uh, it, it seems to me. Good, thanks, Mark. Um, next question relates to what's happening on the international scene while we, the general public, are all highly engaged and preoccupied with COVID-19. So what else is happening in the world of note that we should be focusing on? You mean well, other than the coronavirus? Other than coronavirus. Yeah. Well, but apparently, I don't know, that's a good question. Quite a lot, actually. Uh, there is still chaos and mayhem in lots of the world. I mean, the Middle East is still as big a mess as ever. It's focused people's attention on other things, and, uh, and perhaps that's not been a bad thing, but there's still lots of people living in refugee camps and uh, all kinds of other problems going on around the world. Uh, one of the... In my colleague Gordon Flake from the US Asia Centre might be able to say more about this um, than I, I can. But uh, one of the interesting things is what's happening with Kim Jong Un and whether he's actually uh, on the brink of expiring at the moment uh, or not. And my suggestion was, as an expert on North Korea, that Kim Kardashian should take over, his lesser known sister that uh, hasn't sort of yet thrust herself onto the international stage. But uh, I'm not sure how well that will go down as a suggestion. I might just throw in there the Hong Kong arrests as well. I think that's... Um, oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yes, no, good point. Now, in a serious... Yeah, that's, that's an excellent and serious point. There's no doubt that some authoritarian leaders and regimes will take advantage of this to crack down on political opponents and people they didn't have much time for anyway. And I think in some ways, I don't think it's too cynical to observe that the... Uh, Chinese, the sorry, the leadership in Hong Kong might have regarded the coronavirus as something of a blessing in disguise, in the sense that it's put a stop to all the, pro the street protests. And last week, they arrested some uh, prominent pro-democracy activists without too much uh, pushback from the rest of the population. Uh, and I think other countries will be uh, possibly replicating similar sorts of things in places like Russia and other places, I fear. So, yes, there are some serious things going on uh, as a direct consequence of this as well. Mm, good one. 
Um, next, a, a cluster of questions about our immediate uh, region. Um, so what do we think of um, the role of Australia is um, in regards to COVID affecting our Pacific neighbours? How are we perceived in our region and how's it affected the dynamics in, the, in our immediate region as well? Yes, I think uh, the, our reputation with our Pacific neighbours is not at an all-time high, I think it's fair to say, because up until recently, uh, the possibility of our Pacific neighbours disappearing beneath the waves was their principal uh, concern in life. And our unwillingness to take climate change issues terribly seriously as a country has not gone down terribly well for understandable reasons. I don't know uh, if or whether... Uh, the Pacific countries have been particularly badly affected by this uh, virus already. But I think the experience of Tonga a couple of months ago when they had a measles outbreak there that nearly brought the country to a halt is a good indication of the fact that the health systems in some of these countries aren't well uh, prepared to deal with uh, these kinds of problems. If Australia was able uh, to assist in a useful and meaningful way, either with... Uh, equipment or personnel, I think that would go down very well. And to be fair, uh, Australia has got a pretty good record of intervening in some of the Pacific countries to help restore law and order, democratic processes and uh, various other things. So I think there's something there to build on. Some of that's been undermined, I think, by the whole business about climate change. But this could be a, this could be a way of restoring our reputation uh, if it becomes a more serious problem in that part of the world. The other, the, the other big problem is going to be the countries to our north, uh, because there are major questions about Indonesia's uh, capacity to respond to this particular problem. Uh, and the Indonesian health system is not great at the best of times. But, uh, but I was making the point, something I was writing today about Indonesia's also thinking about spending quite a lot of money on submarines for reasons best known to the Indonesian government. But given the state of their health system, uh, it seems a bit of a no brainer to me to think that that money would be much be better invested in the health system and preparing for these kinds of challenges than it would be in a, in a fleet of new submarines to, uh, to deter who knows what potential uh, threat to their national sovereignty. Uh, the Philippines is also uh, another country that may struggle and may resort to even more authoritarian forms of uh, rule uh, than we're seeing already because the situation there. I think uh, it's in the early phases, but it's likely to get much, much worse before we see the end of it, I fear. So, so there are some big issues and problems in our immediate neighbourhood, I think. So if we can do something useful, that would be good. We've got so many questions. Sadly, a couple of things we can, we can go with that perhaps weren't, um, were alluded to in your presentation, then we better call, it, uh, call a halt to it. But um, Ellen just came in with an interesting one, just following on from the region. Is China's recent action in the South China Sea an act of signalling? And what retaliation could we expect to see from the nations in the region that are currently concerned with trying to combat COVID-19? Sorry, what was the first bit of the question? About China um, yeah. uh, and active signalling, the activity in the South China okay. Sea. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Of all times, and what, um, is it signalling? Is it deliberate? Um, and what response can we uh, expect while we're all preoccupied with COVID-19? One, one issue is about who the we are in this question, whether it's we in Australia, we as the quote-unquote international community, American allies. So that makes a big difference when you're thinking about who the we is and what we should be doing in the response to this. But I think there's two points to make about China, uh, and it's playing a kind of two-level game or, uh, or something along those lines. And one, one aspect of this is what's been dubbed face mask diplomacy. And China's ramped up the production of face masks to 100 million a day, apparently. Uh, and they're pumping them out to all and sundry. And as long as they say nice things about China and don't criticize them too much, I think that's going to go down well. And so they're winning friends and influencing people in that regard through their ability to be able to really crank up the, uh, the industrial base in China in a way that hardly anybody else in the world can do. Uh, in the scale and speed. So that's pretty impressive and it is winning for instance. influence. On the other hand, of course, China seems to be uh, ramping up the pressure on Hong Kong to crack down on dissent. It seems to be sending some fairly un, 
uh, pleasant signals to Taiwan because Taiwan's come out of this looking pretty good because uh, they're the kind of benchmark for a good response to the health crisis, which will irritate uh, Beijing uh, no end. Uh, but some people fear that uh, while America is distracted uh, by its own internal problems, that China might seem to take uh, look to take advantage of this uh, by expanding its influence in the South China Sea and against Taiwan in particular. And there's some evidence, certainly in the South China Sea, that China might actually be doing this. Having said that, America and I think we have been doing freedom of navigation uh, patrols uh, in response. So uh, some, of the, some of the kind of usual uh, responses and actions are being unrolled by both sides, by China and the countries that are seeking to influence its behavior in different ways. So uh, in some ways, uh, it's kind of business as usual, but that business has often been about asserting national rights and uh, trying to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves to promote national rather than transnational interests, unfortunately. Well, Mark, we've got a lot of questions, but time for one more, which you might enjoy. But um, for those people who put in questions, there are 28 questions there. Uh, there is room for us to write answers as well, and uh, they're all very good questions that have been alluded to and already covered in your uh, presentation, or um, we might like to um, to spend some more time answering those. But the, the last one I think uh, is of interest, it's really, um, will coronavirus lead to a softer or harder Brexit? And uh, can Boris Johnson mask the adverse economic consequences of Brexit for the UK? using this one, that's from Derek. So I know Brexit's something dear to your heart, so you might want to comment on what's happening in, in Europe. I don't know whether you or Derek are trying to wind me up, John, but uh, but it doesn't take much doing on the Brexit subject. So I, I, I'm I a fan of the European Union. I think Brexit is completely bonkers. Uh, and I think, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what Johnson does. I mean, this is his chance to actually be a half-decent Prime Minister, because the whole country, I think, was uh, barracking for him when he was in hospital and hoped that he wouldn't expire. Uh, but his attitude to the job, before we, before this happened, he's going around shaking hands at all on sundry and saying, nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. And then he struck down with it. So it was a bit of poetic justice there. And the fact that he didn't turn up to these meetings of the organisation that was charged with making sure that Britain was ready for this, despite numerous warnings about what was going to happen. I think that tells you something about Johnson's attitude to the job, uh, to the fate of the nation and many other things. And uh, I mean, I, I won't bore everybody with my views about Brexit, but I think it's one of the greatest diplomatic own goals in the history of the world, personally, which they will come to rue in the fullness of time. But, uh, but hopefully, uh, they might be at least be able to cooperate a bit on the health front, and that would be something to salvage from the wreckage, perhaps. Mm. Well, there, there are so many questions. Of course, that one leads to the future of the European Union, full stop, and all that sort of thing. So, I think, Mark, I'd like to just call a call a stop to the broadcast uh, dimension of that, and thank you so much for being our very first presenter on our very first webinar in the Institute here in Western Australia. Thank you. Um, pleasure to have you here and we're very fortunate to have you here so thank you very much and if we can answer those questions a terrific question from elizabeth brennan at the end talking about papua new guinea etc those sorts of questions it would be good to to um formally answer with that so i'd like to thank you formally mark and look forward to uh, when we do catch up sharing sharing a uh, a bottle of something uh, as our gift to you which we can't hand you at the moment but um I'd like to thank everyone for participating tonight. Um, and there's a, a number of participants and as usual, an excellent range of questions. I'm only sorry we couldn't answer them all, but we've got them all recorded. Um, a lot of work has gone into preparing this event uh, to make sure that people could, you know, we, we tried various uh, forms of webinar and we liked some and we didn't like others and we, we lighted on this one. But I'd particularly like to thank some of uh, your board um, colleagues Ash, Molly, Gronya, and Amy, indeed the whole committee for the excellent work they've um, put into developing a webinar so we can continue our important role of um, being a forum for discussion and debate on international issues, uh, particularly in the current climate, and we're harnessing technology to do that. So thank you, and, and Mark's been part of that uh, every step of the way. So I hope you enjoyed the trial tonight. 
it just remains to um, point out that uh, there are plenty of these um, webinars on our, and you can refer to them on our national website. I draw your attention to one on the 30th of April, which is Melissa Conley Tyler, the former CEO of the Institute. And she's really talking about reasons to be positive, reasons to be cheerful for those of who remember the Ian Drury and the Blockheads song. But um, that's her fellows address and that's being broadcast. And um, I'll certainly be watching that because she's quite a, quite a thinker on international relations. I think it'll be a very interesting talk. Our next event, uh, our next webinar will be on the 27th of May. So please watch your um, emails and watch our website and for a few of us watch our letterboxes uh, to find out what's going on there. We are planning to have, we've, we've all enjoyed as a committee having Zoom discussions. So we're gonna try and harness for our members only uh, a Zoom discussion on, um, on, a, on, on international affairs and you know, in some ways how we're all weathering the, um, the current, um, the current um, set of issues. So please watch, uh, watch this space for that. And finally, if you're not a member of the Institute, obviously um, I hope you enjoyed tonight. We're a membership driven organisation. I'd encourage you to join and participate, be active, be involved, uh, particularly at this, at, at this stage of, um, of our uh, international life. I think it's all the more important that we're engaged, involved, and, and, and we educate ourselves and each other about what's going on around us. So with that, um, almost perfectly timed, I'll, I'll draw tonight to a close. Once again, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and um, thanks for all the organisers. We'll keep in touch. All the best. Stay, ha stay happy, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Thanks. Cheers. Right. Cheers.